All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us again this morning. Um, before we get things kicked off here with Fanglin's presentation, uh, just a couple of reminders. I wanted to mention that we do have a feedback channel on the Slack workspace. Um, so please, if you think of things along the way that you think could be improved upon or some aspects that you think are going pretty well, um, if you wouldn't mind just jotting a note down there for us, that would be really helpful. I definitely want to make sure that we are improving things as we move forward. Um, we've had one suggestion so far from Mike um, about maybe some music during the practical sessions. It's a little silent and we're all just working away. Um, but anyway, if you have any good ideas, please don't hesitate to share those. Um, and Jamie, can I just chime in for another announcement? So uh, we didn't mention this uh, explicitly, but um, for people who may have questions about talks that have already happened or that you didn't get uh, answered at the time, um, continue to put those in chat. Um, I'm going to be compiling a list of questions that may not have been answered or people may want further clarification on. And at the end of the developer session on Monday, we will be having kind of an open period where people can have these questions asked and answered and uh, some, some open discussion uh, about previous topics. So yeah, keep putting those questions in, in Slack. I'm kind of scraping the, the whole history to make sure everybody gets the answers they need. Great, yeah, thanks for doing that. Okay, so today we're gonna start off with a talk from Fang Lin. Uh, he's gonna be talking to us about the GFS development and, uh, and transitions to operations, specifically on the GFS um, side of things. So Fang Lin, go ahead and uh, your presentation in presentation mode and take it away. Do you see my screen or you see your screen? Uh, we can, can you see, see my screen. presentation? Yep, it's, okay. it looks good. Uh, Thanks for the training committee for uh, inviting me to give a review of the GFS development and the transition to operations. And I'm working at the EMC um, development GFS. I'm currently I'm leading the effort for physics development. Uh, this outline of my presentation. First, I give a, a review of the history of the global forecast system. And uh, second, I will uh, describe the GIF's performance. Um, and the third one is the recent changes and updates of um, to the GFS. And uh, at the end, I discuss uh, the near future plan for the GFS development. So this uh, diagram showing the importance of the global forecast system. So at the NCIP, uh, we have 26 different modeling suites. Uh, on the right hand side, reaching from global, regional, hurricane, wave, and space weather. The GFS uh, is uh, in the center of the universe. Uh, all the auto, other modeling suites are directly or indirectly related to the GFS. So a little bit of history of the GFS. Um, so it's a national center for environmental prediction and uh, the first global forecast system was implemented in 1974. The third solution actually is, uh, um, it's very cost reduction, 2.5 degree, nine years. It's using the how and function or analysis. You can search on the internet what the how analysis is. Uh, it uses sigma coordinate and the uh, primitive primitive uh, equation. The first uh, formal uh, global model, space model, actually was introduced by Dr. Joseph Sena in 1980. Uh, it's a spectrum model. Uh, I had the uh, the fortune to work with uh, Dr. Joseph Sena for a few years uh, back in our old building. Um, he worked until the last day almost. Uh, he passed in 2010, and uh, one month before he passed away, he was still working on this fixture model. Um, so for, he worked there for a long time, 1975 to 2010. And these are some of the snapshots that some of the people worked um, on the global, global model. Or, 
and also for at the EMC, I can I say the upper um, picture it was taken in 1990 uh, in our world, world visibility. And uh, the number one is a, uh, um, in 2017, you can see, uh, now we have a very nice building and uh, if you have interesting work in the EMC uh, or NSAFE, uh, now we have a very nice facility there. And uh, these are some of the um, folks are still working and at EMC and actually Michael Ake there, he moved to um, Anka. And the history of the GFS, uh, so I said that the, the spectral model, uh, we start to use that in 1980. Um, so in the past four decades or so, there have not changes been made. And uh, the first uh, um, model was uh, um, the spectral zoom board truncation. It has 12 layers. You can see the vertical the model and layers uh, um, changed from 12 to 16, 2019. Um, not many changes in terms of vertical resolution, but the, for the horizontal resolution, it has changed from uh, in the 98, 400 km, km or so, to our day, 13 km for the global model. Um, in terms of vertical coordinate, uh, first to start to use the Sigma uh, coordinate and change it to the hybrid. Uh, you learn, and in 2015, we switched to a hybrid semi-Lagrangian. Uh, I'll talk later in more detail about the last implementation June 2019. We start to use, first for the first time, start to use the finite volume um, cubic, cubic sphere called um, dynamic code. Um, a selected major changes for the GFS, I, I can't go through all the changes, but there are some of them I like to highlight there. Um, the first one, like in, in May 2007, uh, the data simulation system uh, was changed from spectral statistical interpolation to grid point uh, statistical interpolation. And the vertical coding uh, was changed from sigma to hybrid sigma pressure. Um, we have been also, uh, whenever there's new satellite observations, we try to incorporate in our data simulation system. Um, so you will see the data simulation, the satellite data um, changes all the time. Uh, in 2009, 2009 um, there's major changes in the data simulation as well, using the variation of quality control. And also flow, flow dependent uh, weighting of background error uh, covariance. In 2010, there was a major change. Actually, I was worked on this implementation. Uh, we increased the model resolution from 38 kilometer to 23 kilometer. Um, we we start to use the um, R A R R T M radiation um, package. We were using the NASA Goddard. Um, Minda Chow's uh, um, non wave and short wave radiation. So in 2010, we switched to the R team and radiation. Um, also, use for the first time, start to use the um, new mass flux shadow conviction. It was based on the deep conviction scheme modified uh, for the shadow conviction. Um, also, use the positive uh, definite tracer transport scheme. That's actually my work. Uh, we used to have a lot of negative features in the model, uh, in the learning version of the model. Um, this scheme really re removed those negative features and uh, um, improved the, the, the data usage from satellite operation. Uh, in 2012, um, the, for data, another major data change for data simulation uh, switched from the um, hybrid uh, I start to use the hybrid uh, uh, in cave 3D bar. Um, so this first time using the, the uh, in cave approach. And in 2015, uh, we switched to the dynamic code, the major change from the Euler to the semi Lagrangian and dynamic code. Also, the resolution increased from 25 kilometer to 13 kilometer. Um, also, another change is the radiation. Uh, 
is using the mechanic application uh, approximation and also start to use a hybrid uh, EDMF PBR scheme and the TK dissipative heating. In 2016, uh, another major change in data simulation and uh, switched from hybrid ENKF 3D bar to 4D and hybrid ENKF uh, approach. Also, we start to use the, not only the clear sky, also the cloudy sky and radiance data from satellite application. Uh, in 2017, um, we, for the first time, we put the GS Global Spectrum model. It's still the same model, but they uh, put it under the uh, NOAA environment modeling system framework that's a unified uh, framework used also by other centers. Uh, you implemented the near surface temperature uh, model. It uh, simulates the dial cycle uh, much better than before. Um, also use the, the high resolution bodies and data set like for slow orbital visitation type and soil type. Um, I talk about the, the last year's change in more detail later. And so the second topic uh, of my presentation is on the GFS performance. This is the view of the GFS performance in the um, past 25 years or so. Plotted here is a uh, um, 500 millibar alarm equation uh, in northern hemisphere, and his, it's a uh, PDF to distribution. And each this is daily data for each each line represents a uh, one year worth of data. You can see the distribution shift uh, gradually from year to year from the left and uh, towards to the right, and um, the PDF distribution. Um, and in the past few years, you can see the, the last few uh, nights and they are overlapping each other. That means there's kind of much changes. But over the years, the score has been gradually uh, increasing, uh, being PDF and also the shape of the PDF has moved to the right direction. And this is another way to look at the 500 millibar alarm equation. Uh, this is still in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it compares the relative importance uh, of a model um, and uh, data simulation. And the blue lines, this uh, from the surface R, this uh, version, um, frozen version of the model used for um, real analysis with forecast. It's a model in early 2000s. Um, the red lines are northern, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. The start tension line uh, is for the southern hemisphere. Uh, this is uh, real time operational model performance. You can see the model forecast scale has been increasing gradually. Um, we start from 1984 up to now. The increase is about uh, 0.1 per decade. So it's really difficult to uh, increase the model perform uh, forecast scale. Um, if you, every time if I um, have a, a new scheme, new observation, uh, if you can move the needle a little bit, uh, and that's already a major achievement. Um, and put uh, GFS uh, in the context of other international, major international models, you can see um, this here, this uh, red line is a GFS. Uh, Compared to other models, GIF is still first behind the ECMWF uh, on the top. Um, this ECMW is the brown line, triangle marks, and uh, the, uh, this blue line is the UK Meta Office. So GIF is a slight better than the uh, Canadian uh, model, also um, better than the GMA. Um, and also, overall, the GFS has a um, better forecast in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. And that has been a, actually a drawback of the GFS. Uh, like ECMWF, its performance in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are, are compatible. And that's the indication we need to make better use of for the satellite data. Because in the southern hemisphere, there's not um, many conventional data. Uh, another matrix we use, uh, actually we also used by the um, 
and WS headquarters to measure the um, improvement is the so-called useful forecast and days. That means uh, the days at which the, for the forecast and those useful scale at alarm creation at, uh, equal to 0.6. So over the years, uh, the useful forecast scale has been gradually increasing, and it's also very slow. It's about one day improvement per decade. And uh, right now the TFS useful uh, forecast scale is uh, around 8.5 days. It's about um, 0.5 days um, behind the ECMWA. Uh, um, now I talk about the recent changes and the upgrades. So a major change, uh, probably many of you know, uh, we switched uh, on the dynamic call from the spectral model to the finite volume cubic sphere dynamic core uh, in 2019. The work started in 2016. Uh, the dynamic core uh, is developed um, at GFDR, the geophysical fluid dynamic map uh, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, it's also a part of the NOAA. Uh, so in, 20, in last year, after uh, almost two years of uh, development, more than two years actually, uh, we had the model implemented for operation in June 12. And the configuration of the model is uh, so called C768, and it's 13 kilometer horizontal resolution in the vertical. Uh, it is still has um, 64 layers, like the other spectral model. The top uh, was raised a little bit uh, up to 0.2 hectopascal. And for data simulation, we increased the uh, resolution um, from 35 kilometer also to 25 kilometer and still eight member. Um, we used to run the model uh, at high resolution for the first 10 days and then closer resolution uh, after day 10. For this implementation, we started to run a, a uniform resolution for all the 16 days of uh, medium range forecast. The dynamic call, uh, we use the non hydrostatic option. And the model has both hydrostatic and non hydrostatic options. Um, we use the non hydrostatic uh, option, but it the, mod, the dynamic call is run in single position. Uh, our test is still using single position and can save about 30% of the CPU time. Um, the, the speed uh, um, is very critical um, for NWP forecast because we only have a, a limited time window. We have to deliver the products on time. For the physics, it uh, was a major change. Uh, we uh, switched from the, um, for the microphysics, we, we replaced the older and Zalka um, microphysics with the GFDR microphysics scheme. Uh, all the physics scheme, uh, Schemes are still running with double precision. So um, I mentioned earlier the some of the changes is a list of the all the changes um, for the physics um, and the dynamics. The dynamic the physics uh, actually was first written in a so-called interoperable uh, physics. Um, um, so it's called IPD, Interoperable Physics Package. Uh, now you, this, it's, everything has been built into the um, CCPP. Um, also working on the um, I.O. to the, use the so-called red grid component and to speed up the I.O. As I mentioned, we used the GFT Microphysics. Um, also updated the autumn photo, photochemistry. Um, we input, uh, also for the first time in, uh, included uh, the, the water vapor for the chemistry in the upper atmosphere. Uh, input the land surface model for soil evaporation. Uh, modified the conveying scheme and also updated the stochastic physics. Um, input the NCST and also updated the, um, the the topography data set and to the latest one, so called the GMTED 2010. <clears throat> so, this is the overall structure of the, this model on the GFS version 15. Uh, so, the GSM, the old spectrum model, was replaced by the uh, 
if we see in dynamical and learning at 32 bit precision, physics at 64 bit precision, uh, another major change is the microphysics scheme. The GFTR microphysics does uh, has uh, the modern and it uh, it has five um, six species, but the old Zaka only has one proglastic quantity uh, total ice cloud and water cloud actually and and it together the single proglass variable and the partitioning is, was based on a temperature. Um, I think Nini presented this already, um, but this uh, ozone physics, um, so it's based on the um, total chemistry transfer model. It's, it's a simple um, photo chemistry um, model. Uh, another is the inclusion of the water vapor physics. Uh, I skipped this as well. I think Nini also mentioned this. Um, I want to talk a little more in detail about this um, so-called red grid component. In the past, um, we use the same node to run the computation and also for the IO. Um, it was slow, and so for this FE3 model development, we we separate the, con uh, the concern. So uh, when the model runs, all the data uh, for that are pushed to a, a separate node, uh, nodes, actually. Um, the, we can use uh, um, any number of groups. Each group has um, parallelized uh, um, I.O. and with many nodes you can use. So uh, with model, higher model resolution and uh, more um, so you should you will have more I uh, have larger an I O demand. So this really uh, improves the model performance. You can push, um, no matter on how high your model resolution is, you can always increase the number of uh, the light group groups and also increase the number of nodes for each group. And this is the overall performance we did at that time. Um, the evaluation for um, the version 15 before it was uh, uh, implemented for operation. And uh, so for the northern hemisphere, um, and the 500 million bar alarming question uh, was increased by 0.01 uh, overall. Uh, it was based on almost a three and a half year uh, retrospective runs. Uh, you can see the, the lower panel, lower left, shows the difference between uh, the GFS version 15 compared to the other spectrum model. And um, up to 10 days, uh, the increase um, are all significant. On the right hand side is the southern hemisphere. Uh, overall, the scale score was also improved. Um, another major improvement found from this uh, version 15 compared to the old model is the um, precipitation forecast. On the left hand side, uh, the equitable rate score. Um, this is for the Canos region, uh, continental United States. Uh, the upper left, this one is the old spectrum model. On the right hand side, uh, is the difference between the new model and the old model. Everything in blue color means the new model is better. Uh, the lower left shows the bias score. Um, so there's a um, model. Um, the, the model is a little bit drier for the new model, um, but the, the equitable street score and was improved. Another major improvement is the diagonal cycle for the precipitation. Uh, if you look at the upper right um, panel, um, and the green corner is the observation, and this is for a particular summer uh, averaged over the United States. Um, the red corner was the old spectrum model. You can see uh, it does it doesn't match the observed uh, dialog variation, and the new model, the GIF version 15 in blue corner, match much better with the observation. Another major uh, improvement uh, you know, for the version 15 uh, was the wind pressure relation. 
For the other spectrum model, uh, this um, red line, we've often observed uh, even the pressure and um, center pressure of uh, storms can be very low, but is when the um, speed uh, is limited. And so it does not have this observed relation. This black line is observed uh, when the pressure relation from the storms. Uh, this um, blue and uh, green lines shows uh, two versions of the FSA model we tested. And they both uh, input the wind pressure relation. The, our final um, selection or configuration was uh, uh, this green line. It's the uh, one version of the automation scheme we used, so called um, hot equal to um, six. It's an automation scheme option. So even though we met uh, major achievements for the version 15, there were still uh, some concerns concerns uh, uh, during the evaluation. So uh, the model should uh, excessive could bias in the winter season. Uh, it has this uh, synoptic system move seems uh, moves too fast to the east, uh, so called a progressive bias. Um, the hurricane track forecast is for especially for the strong storms and uh, the tank area uh, was larger than the other spectrum model. Uh, there were some uh, also temperature code bias in the stratosphere and the boundary layer immersion was not improved. We, and the GSM, the other model also struggled with the boundary, boundary layer immersion and we didn't make a much improvement in the uh, version 15 either. So these are the concerns or things we want, want to improve in the version 16. Um, so we started to prepare the version 16 actually before uh, the version 15 was implemented for operation. We started on early 2019. Um, so when we were designed the version 16, uh, we, we want to increase the vertical resolution. There's a reason. Um, so the, this history of the GFC can say we made many changes for the horizontal resolution, but we didn't uh, increase the vertical resolution in the past almost 18 years. 18 years. So the last time we changed the vertical resolution was uh, in 22. And this is reason actually it's very, usually changing horizontal resolution is much easier than changing the vertical resolution. Uh, there is much more work involved in the data simulation uh, in changing the vertical resolution than in horizontal resolution. So this is the structure of the um, all a few configurations we tested. Uh, the black line is the ECMWF 137 layer model, and this uh, blue is the uh, 64 layer GFS. We test uh, two configurations: one is the 197 layer, another is the 127. Uh, it, what should here is the uh, data P for each layer uh, change with uh, distribution with the uh, height or pressure in the vertical. Um, so this blue line and this green line is our final configuration. Uh, it has higher resolution than ECMWF, than ECMWF FS in the troposphere, but closer resolution in the upper, in the stratosphere and mesosphere than ECS model. Uh, overall, the resolution is much higher uh, than the 64 layer in both the troposphere and the um, stratosphere. Um, so major changes uh, made to the model uh, for version 16. Uh, so the model top was uh, pushed to uh, upper stratosphere to missile pass uh, about 80 kilometer. Uh, also made some major physics changes. One is the PBR scheme. We replaced the hybrid uh, EDMF with the scale wheel total kinetic energy based EDMF. Also revised the background diffusivity. Uh, for the first time, we included uh, the non stationary quantum drag primary, uh, primitization. Uh, included in, in the model, also updated the radiation scheme. Um, 
the updater is in a solar radiation absorption for water vapor and also update the cloud overlap or something. Uh, we made some changes to the GFDR microphase scheme um, for the computation of the ice cloud effective radius. Uh, also made some changes to the lower land surface model and revise the ground heat flux calculation over slow cover surface and also introduce the vegetation impact on surface energy budget over urban area. Also, for, for the first time, we coupled the, uh, the Wave Watch 3 model and to the global model, that's a consolidation uh, for the NCIP modeling suite. And although the company is one way, that means there's no feedback from the Wave to the atmosphere model. Uh, a few highlights of the phase exchanges. Uh, what showed here is the impact of the uh, Hybrid the, the TKEDMF um, and the PPR um, scheme. Uh, so the this new TKEDMF and PPR scheme uh, is a higher order um, has a higher order accuracy in interpretance um, representation, and it also includes the moist processes and has non-local momentum mixing, and it's a scale well. Uh, on the right hand side, it shows the uh, the new scheme is more accurate than the um, old hybrid EDMF compared to a, a large A dissemination for both water whip, cloud water and the wind speed. And another um, improvement in the version 16 is the, uh, in the tropics, the copio quasi biennial oscillation. Uh, this left picture showed uh, is a, this is an MPP type simulation for two years. Um, first of is a um, um, prescribed SST. Uh, you can see the the current operation model cannot uh, is not able to capture the quasi biennial oscillation. Uh, in version 16, after we included the non stationary non stationary quantum drag uh, scheme, uh, it capture the copio signal, but still the copy or the, uh, the amplitude and phase uh, are still not uh, uh, accurate enough compared to observations. So we are still trying to improve this in version 17. But the overall it's a much, uh, it's a major improvement uh, compared to the uh, current, compared to the current operation model. Uh, another improvement in the stratosphere uh, on the left shows the temperature. Uh, upper left is the uh, current operation model. There's a temperature at one millibar. The black line is the analysis. The color lines are uh, for the forecast a different dating time. You can see the model granted, uh, has uh, code bias built up with deep forecast dating time. The lower panel is the uh, version 16. Uh, if it's worth 16, you can see the forecast matches the analysis, the blank line much better. Um, this uh, from the... Okay. Uh, on the right hand side is the water vapor and distribution and in the upper atmosphere for each month, starting from uh, September 2019 uh, to May 2020. Um, this water vapor distribution, actually this is a verification provided by a climate prediction center and Craig now, and he said this is the first time uh, the GFS uh, is able to capture the signal variation of water vapor in the stratosphere. And this is also a major improvement. It, it has, uh, it, um, it will help us uh, to get better uh, with the flux, flux calculation also for um, data simulation. Application. Uh, I mentioned earlier we covered uh, the answer to the wave model. This uh, are the configurations uh, of the wave model. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the details. Uh, overall, it's the improvement uh, of the wave products uh, over the globe, but we removed some of the uh, high resolution wave. Uh, models near the coast. Um, for data simulation also made uh, many changes. I mentioned earlier, um, after it's very difficult to, 
to increase the vertical, model vertical resolution, one reason is because of data dissemination. Uh, you have to make a lot of adjustments. Um, so for the version 16, we switched uh, from this ensemble square root filter and to, the, to use the local ensemble comma filter, LETKF. Uh, also for the, for the first time, we start to use the <coughs> Four dimensional incremental analysis update. That means the increments uh, is not added uh, um, as a whole at one time. It is gradually uh, added to the forecast model um, across six hours. Um, we use a new, also a new variational quality control algorithm. Uh, there are not many other changes. You can say we start to use um, some of the observations like the um, Clear scale readings from the API. Um, also, like hammer worry, the went uh, observations. Uh, we start to assimilate additional GPRs, GPS RO data. Uh, another thing I want to highlight is that for the first time, we start to assimilate high density, flat level wind temperature and moisture observation, and so called HTOPS in tropical storm environment. Um, Uh, this is example to show the impact of the data examination uh, using the uh, IAU and technique. Uh, showed here uh, the left hand side, they are all arm uh, root mean square error um, with or without the IAU. And the left panel shows the diff, the impact uh, on wind. And the middle panel is the temperature, and the right hand, the right hand side is the uh, water vapor. So you can see overall, basically I use RMS, it's red nine with dots. Um, the RMS here uh, are reduced. And this is a collaboration with the R and PSAR on the work. Um, I mentioned the impact of the um, high density observation of um, trunk forecast earlier. So what we show here is the um, trunk forecast uh, error. Um, with or without the, this high density observation um, for strong storm, all storms and also strong storms. The improvement uh, is uh, uh, most significant for the strong storms. On the right hand side, you can say for storm, uh, um, when the, the, the wind maximum greater than 50 knots, uh, you can see this red line compared to um, this black line was the control version 16, and the green line uh, is the current operation model. So with this HDOPS, uh, the chunk error was overall reduced for up to seven days uh, of forecast leading time. And uh, this was, the, the verification was done for two hurricane seasons. Um, so the version 16 implementation also made some major changes in infrastructure. So in operational science center, we always have to be conscious about the computational, the timing, and also the um, human the mass storage uh, cost. And so we were using the so-called NAMS IO format in the binary, and we increased the model work, vertical resolution, and uh, the model forecast file, the history, so-called history file size increased uh, by a factor of two. So it put it put a lot of stress on our uh, infrastructure. So we decided to use so-called uh, compressed density. Uh, it was very successful. Uh, so the it is nothing with information loss uh, for the atmosphere and state variable, but there's no information information loss for the surface variables. And the compression ratio is about um, uh, five times. Uh, also we and boot the post process and so called uh, mm -hmm. the UPP and the inside the model. And so to reduce the IO traffic, so the post processing is done along with the forecast model. Um, and this uh, so called uh, high water mark, probably usually uh, this only say in the operation center. We we check the model, the GFS run four times per day, including both the GDS and the GFS cycles. Uh, we need to measure um, uh, the computational cost. 
<clears throat> so, so for the current operation model, you can say it uses at the peak time, uh, including all steps of, uh, around 400 nodes. And the version 16 will be using six, 760 nodes. Uh, with every time we change the model, we need to keep the model running almost uh, uh, at the same speed. And that means make the product uh, delivered at the same time. Um, so this, uh, I don't want to need to, um, you do not know the details of the, the slide, just show how many uh, runs we, we had to make to for evaluation and the test and the model. Uh, we need to take, uh, evaluate the model for performance and also um, for, for speed. Um, So this is the GFS validation. We have a so-called EMC model validation group. Uh, they are independent, uh, independent from the model developers and give a uh, fair and uh, unbalanced uh, evaluation. Also, the community was uh, involved for the evaluation. And you can go to this website for details and uh, highlight a few things. Uh, the common sense uh, of this version 16 and so it and we, Reduced this uh, so-called progressive bias in version 16, and also improved the precipitation forecast. Uh, improved the reduced the cold bias in winter. Uh, we found in version 15. Uh, it also showed that can resolve the shallow cold air mass much better, and also improved the hurricane forecast. And uh, this showed the uh, 500 millibar alarm migration. Uh, you can say from version 15 to version 16 uh, has been improved uh, for all seasons. And this example showing the uh, forecast of synoptic uh, uh, waves and this analysis. You can say version 15 uh, was not able to capture this. Uh, 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 this low pressure center uh, in the analysis and the version 16 and similarly did much better this feature, this cutoff low. And uh, this uh, another case for the heavy precipitation over the co west coast. Uh, on the lower right is the stage four analysis. This is the version 16 and the, the version 15 basically missed uh, this uh, intense um, precipitation event. Uh, overall, for hurricane forecast, the version 16 is better than current operation model for the North Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific. Um, also, the intensity uh, is also uh, improved in version 16. And there are still some uh, concerns for the uh, version 16. Uh, it seems it has increased the rate of track bias at longer forecast lead time. Uh, it has a um, um, larger false alarm um, for storm genesis in the West and North Atlantic region. Uh, the the CAPE, uh, the uh, convective available potential energy was reduced in version 16. This actually has, uh, is a major issue for the, the version 16. Um, there's still uh, not much improvement uh, for the forecast of immersion uh, in the boundary layer. Uh, this is example of the problem for the uh, false alarm in the Atlantic region. You can see the red square shows the false alarm. And there's too many uh, storm genesis in version 16. Uh, so this a key issue I mentioned. So the, the red line is the version 16 compared to uh, this night black line is the observation and the black line is the current operation model. And we're still trying to figure out the cost and uh, need to be improved in next version. Uh, so overall, because uh, we found the version 16, it has a tendency to overmix the boundary layer. Uh, and also PBR height is higher in version 15 than version 15 version. <clears throat> um, okay. So the model version 16 is scheduled for, uh, for implementation in, in February 2021 and the NCP director uh, has approved the implementation and the model is currently is uh, um, being 
um, has to be transitioned to the NCIP central operation. Uh, okay, I have a couple minutes. I should uh, work quickly in the future. And uh, so at EMC, we do the model um, for forecast and cross and time scale from minutes. Uh, to to one year and also scale from few kilometers to uh, like 20, 30 kilometers. Uh, so the next step is the build a uh, so-called community-based unified forecast system. Uh, it will be coupled end-to-end uh, -end Earth system. Uh, we'll use uh, the community infrastructure and uh, like you probably learned this week, uh, like the and common common community physics package CCPP also and, and like year seven from the opposite and they are developed uh, uh, at different places. Um, so this uh, diagram showing the future. Uh, so our version seventeen uh, will be implemented in twenty twenty four. It will be fully coupled uh, on ocean. Uh, atmosphere ice wave model um, for both uh, NWP. Uh, and also for signal and sub signal forecast. Uh, I stop there, and this my last slide showing the structure of the future UFS model and the couple model and the consolidation of the global models. Uh, thank you for your attention. All right, thanks, Feng Lin, for that overview talk of what you guys are working on there. Uh, do we have any questions from anybody? I didn't see anything in Slack or on chat. So if you if you do have a question, please feel free to unmute and ask it. Yeah, I have a question. This is the way. So also you mentioned that the topography data was uh, replaced from the one data set to another data set. Is there any reason to replace that that, that uh, topography data? Thank you. Uh, and there are two things. One is the resolution of the new data set is higher. Uh, the, another reason is because uh, the old data, actually, the, the height, especially over the Greenland region, uh, the old data was not accurate. Uh, the, is to know about Greenland and also uh, uh, some issues over the Arctic region. And so that's the reason we uh, use the higher resolution uh, new data set. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for the question. Do we have any other questions? I just wanted to mention that I appreciate um, seeing some of the deficiencies with the V16 still in place. Um, it's nice for new users to get a feel for that as they can spin up on using this model and, and turn into developers. This is, these are some areas that um, you might choose to focus on. So thanks for, thanks for that overview, really appreciate it. Yeah, Jimmy, that's a uh, good point. So we really want to go, uh, the reason we have this training also is to engage in community and all with, for those who have interest in working for EMC and also contributed to the GFS. Uh, so we, you get to know what, actually the model is not perfect. We still have a lot of problems. We need to, to hear from the community, uh, um, for the work like you and help us make the model better. To, to someday will be a better than you say, you say, you say WF model and with your hair. Awesome. All right, sounds great. Thanks so much, Feng Lin. Really appreciate it. Um, our next presenter is going to be Tracy Hurtnecki, and she's going to talk to us about the unified post processor. So let's see. Feng Lin, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen. There we go. All right, great mode, perfect. Everybody hear me all right? Yep, sounds good. Great, thank you, Jamie, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Tracy Hurtnicki, and I'll be uh, training on the NCEPS Unified Post Processor, the UPP. 
I would also like to acknowledge the rest of the team that is listed here. This is a brief uh, outline of what to expect in the slides. So we'll give a brief outline or a, a brief overview. Talk about the functions and features of the UPP, um, the components, so the inputs and outputs of UPP. And then we'll go over some optional um, items such as customizing UPP output, regridding, and downstream application use. And then some ongoing activities uh, for development of UPP. So UPP was developed at NCEP. It is used to post-process uh, forecast output for a variety of operational models, such as the GFS, the HER, RAP, and NAM, and so on. And it is also included as the post-processing component for the UFS weather applications. So for the UFS MRW, uh, which was uh, released on, uh, in October, the version 1.1, and it will also be included in the upcoming release of the UFS SRW version one that is slated for December 2020. Support and documentation for UPP is provided through the Developmental Testbed Center, so our team that was listed on the first slide. And um, I've included a link to the user's guide uh, for version 1.1 as well as the link to the UFS community support forums. That's just the generic link to the community support forum and then you would just go under UPP or the, the post processor section if you had um, questions or problems with the UPP and we would um, help you with that. Okay. So the UPP ingests the model forecast files from the FE3 dynamical core, um, both in NEMS.io and in that CDF format. It performs vertical interpolation from the model's native vertical coordinate system to uh, NWS standard output levels. For example, pressure levels, height levels on AGL or MSL, as well as other levels and surfaces. It produces numerous fields and diagnostic output quantities, um, such as those that are used operationally. And it also incorporates the JCSDA community radiative transfer model that is used to compute derived satellite brightness temperatures uh, for a variety of instruments and channels. It is an MPI parallel code, so it will run in dis with distributed memory. And then the output from UPP um, is in a standard WMO uh, GRIB2 format. This is a list of some of the example fields that are generated. Uh, for, exa for example, um, temperature, height, humidity, wind, um, uh, precipitation, mixing ratios um, on isobaric levels, um, sea level pressure, uh, shelter, level, shelter level variables, uh, variety of precipitation related fields, PBL related fields, a number of diagnostic process, products such as CAPE and vorticity for severe weather events, relative humidity, um, helicity, uh, things like that. It outputs radiative and surface fluxes, a variety of cloud related fields such as total cloud, uh, low mid high clouds, uh, a number of aviation products as well as synthet synthetic satellite products. You can find a full list of the available fields um, through that link there. Um, and that's also linked in the UPP documentation um, for UFS applications. Uh, UPP can, output can be output on a number of vertical levels. Um, for example, native model levels. Um, there's 47 isobaric levels that are included. So starting from uh, 1,000 and up to 25 millibars um, every, uh, sorry, <laughs> from 1,000 up to 75 millibars every 25 millibars, and then uh, a few above that as well. Uh, there's 15 flight or wind energy levels available. Um, those are in AGL or MSL, and those are listed there. Uh, soil layers, um, obviously that varies depending on the LSM used. 
uh, as I said, low, mid, and high cloud la layers. Uh, there's six PBL layers, and each of those layers is averaged over a 30 hectopascal deep layer. Uh, outputs two uh, radar reflectivity levels um, at one and four kilometers AGL. And you can also, there's also a number of uh, things at surface and shelter levels as well. So this diagram shows the components of the UPP and the red box um, shows the uh, files and um, executables that um, encompass UPP. So NSET post is the, the main driver of UPP. It's the executable and it requires uh, input files from um, model output from the FE3 dynamical core. Um, and it also requires a control file. And this control file is a list of um, the output fields that uh, the user wants to have output. And then with those files input, it outputs the uh, GRIB2 output files. And those files can easily be used in downstream applications, such as regridding, visualization, and verification. The UFS application um, workflows uh, do create all the necessary input files and data links that are required for UPP to run. So you don't have to do anything. It's all set up within the workflow. For example, with the MRW application, um, it, this is the SIEM workflow that does all of this for you. All right, so I'm going to go over the input files, all of the input files that UPP requires. Um, as I said, these are all created and linked within the application workflow. The first one, as I already mentioned, was the model output file in uh, NEMS.io or NetCDF format. Second, a ITAG file. Uh, this is essentially the UPP name list, and this is produced automatically um, from uh, the user input from the workflow. The control file, which I uh, had mentioned in the previous um, diagram, um, this lists the desired fields for output. And then the UPP also uses additional data files, for example, uh, microphysics lookup tables and coefficient files for satellites. And in the next few slides, I'm going to go over one through three in more detail. So the model output. Um, UPP ingests the uh, model output um, from the FE3 dynamical core in NetCDF or um, NEMS.io format using the NSEP libs WARF IO library package. Um, by default, the UPP reads a set list of fields from the model output files for basic diagnostics. And this is, these basic fields are, are required for the UPP to run correctly. And those are things like the, like the state variables, like um, you know, pressure and temperature and so on. And, and without those in the model output, those, the UPP will not run. So if you do any sort of developmental work or anything, then you just need to make sure that you're not slimming your, your net CDF or, or your model file down too much. Uh, model output um, is found in the case workflow directory under um, the render, and it consists of two files that UPP uh, requires. The first one is the atmospheric file. Um, this just has the atmospheric fields that are on the, the model levels. And then uh, the surface file that has a number of 2D fields at the surface as well as other levels. The second input file is the ITAG name list. And this is not something that you would create or modify or anything, but this this is just for your information. The ITAG name list is read by UPP. It's generated automatically by the application workflow for each forecast hour. And here is an example of the MRW ITAG name list. So the first thing in the list is the atmospheric file. Um, and this is the, app, uh, the model output file uh, with fields on the model levels. The second thing in the list is the uh, model output format. So for example, NetCDF or NEMS.io. And then you, it lists the uh, format of the UPP output to expect and uh, currently only group two is supported. The forecast valid time in this specific 
um, format. Um, the GFS, or so sorry, the model name, which would either be the, the GFS uh, for the MRW or uh, something else for uh, uh, other models. And then finally, the model output file with fields on surface and other uh, uh, surface level or uh, other 2D levels. Uh, so the surface file. Um, the last thing I'll go over is the control file. So re UPP reads a control file to determine which fields to post process. Default control files are used within the UFS weather applications. However, those can be customized to add or remove fields or levels. That'll be something I'll go over in uh, a few minutes. So the default MRW control files, they're located in a pre-configured location on the Cheyenne machine and um, as well as the no machines. And they um, are the post X config uh, GFS text files. These file or, or and also the post X yeah. Uh, so either so the post X config GFS text files for either F00 or for all forecast lead times. So the F00 is used to post process model output at the zero hour forecast lead time. And then um, the other one is used to post, post process all model output at um, all other forecast lead times. So these files I wanna mention are not user friendly. So they're not easily configurable and users do not modify them directly for customization. Although they are read directly by the UPP for outputting your variables. All right, so that is the input files um, um, in more detail. And so the UPP output. So the output files are found in your case workflow directory. So case root, um, and that'll be under the run directory. And they have the naming convention of gfsprs.grib and then the forecast hour. So output from the UPP is in standard wgrib2 format. It includes all of the files or fields that were requested in the control file. Um, and one thing to note, if, if you have a field listed in your control file um, and you don't see it in your output, it could be due to your specific model configuration, for example, um, your microphysics or just the fact that, um, just the fact of, of certain fields are not available for certain models. For the MRW application, I will note that the output projection is in a Gaussian grid, and you can regrid to another projection using the third-party software uh, WGRIB2, and I believe that is um, distributed within the NSEP libs, as well as you can load a module on Cheyenne easily. All right, this is the first optional um, item that I'll go over, so customizing your UPP output. Um, so if you wanted to um, modify your control files to uh, output different fields than what is in the default um, configuration file. So for the UFS weather application, MRW version 1.1, um, this is a functional um, uh, customization option. Um, so one thing I will note is for version 1.0 of the MRW, this was not functional at the time. So this was newly added for version 1.1. All files you, that, that are you, all files utilized for customization are found in the MRW application code directory, and that is under the SRC post PARM directory. So under your, your top application code directory, um, that's where you would find these files. Um, there are three main files that you should be aware of when you're customizing EPP output. The first is a post control XML file. This lists requested fields for output, and this is the file that users would um, modify. The second file is the post available fields.xml. This lists all available fields um, that can be output by UPP and includes the details for group two tables and output. This is not a file that you would modify. 
unless you're doing some heavy development. And then the last one is the file that UPB actually reads directly. And this is the postex config gfs.txt file. It's created um, from these two XML files and lists all of the requested fields from your post control XML. So just to note that customizing the parameter file does require knowledge about what variables can be output for your particular model and configuration. So that's something that you need to be aware of. So we'll go into more details about each of those um, control files. So the first up is the post control GFS XML. Like I said, this is a user modified XML file that lists all of the desired fields to be output by UPP. One thing to note is that formatting is important. So just use that file as a guide and follow the formatting of the, uh, the rest of the file. I'll go over um, what's included in this one. So these are a couple examples from the uh, post control XML. Um, so each variable is going to have its own parameter block. And so the, the short name in red is the character name that describes the product or the field. And then if you have a product or field, if you have a product or field, um, that is available on vertical coordinate levels, such as temperature on isobaric surfaces, then you would also um, include the level tag and include a list of the vertical coordinate, or sorry, the vertical levels that you want to have output. The final thing that is listed in this file um, is the grid precision package. Uh, generally, you do not um, modify this value. And I don't believe you even have to include this because it is included in, in the uh, post available fields file, which is, which I'll talk about now. I'm sorry, Tracy, we're getting a lot of noise from your microphone. It seems like we're getting a lot of clicks and clacks. Okay, uh, sorry. No, it's okay. I uh, just wanted to mention it. Sorry about that. It's okay. Go ahead. All right, um, so this next file um, is the post available fields uh, .xml. Um, this lists all available fields and details for the group two tables and output. Generally, this uh, file is not modified unless you're doing development. And this is uh, the, a couple examples from this field. Um, so within the parameter block, um, the first thing that would be listed is a unique UPP ID number. And so each field has its um, own unique number assigned to it. And this is just how the UPP source code um, tracks this field through the, through the, the UPP flow. Um, again, it has the short name, um, the character name describing the product or field. Um, and then it has um, the P name, this is the field abbreviation that's used by the group two libraries. So for any of the temperature fields that, for example, that P name would be TMP. This is also um, the abbreviation that you'll see in the output as well. And then vertical coordinate level and types. So the, the type the level type. So for example, um, for temperature on specific height level above ground, um, that type is spec height level above ground. Uh, for isobaric surfaces, it's just isobaric surface and that'll be um, the same across all of the similar fields like that. And then for this um, for specific example, it also includes the levels. So this one is only for two meter temperature and then the level is two meters. And then again, the grid precision packing, which is in this field, or sorry, in this file as well. All right, so those are the two XML files um, that UPP uses to uh, create the post X config file, which is the flat text file that UPP actually reads. And so in this little diagram, 
um, these are the, the post control XML and the post available fields XML. And then in order to make the text file, um, it uses both of those to create it. So if, if you do have a modified post control XML GFS or XML, you will need to run the following steps to convert to a new flat text file. So you would go into your um, UFS source code uh, uh, top directory into sort post parm. You would edit the post control GFS XML and then um, add or remove fields or levels from that file. And then in that same directory, you would simply type make. And when you type make, that calls a Perl program. It's going to use both of those XMLs, the information from both of them, to do the conversion to that text file. All right, so now you have your text file, um, your customized text file. So how do you use that in the UFS um, workflow? So once it's created, the new flat text files um, will need to be copied or linked within the scene case directory to um, so in your case directory, like a case root to SORC mods um, SCR UFS ATM. So this is just an example of copying one of the text files to that directory. Seam is first going to look in this directory for the UPP parameter files. And if they're not, if, if there are no files in that directory, then the workflow will automatically default to the, param the default parameter files in the pre-configured pre location. So if you do have uh, modified flat text files, you do want to add them to this so that Seam can um, use those for, for the UPP run. So assuming that you did all of this work before you even um, set up and built and run your model, um, uh, you can then set up, build, and run your, your case as usual, and UPP, UPP will use the custom flat files from this directory. Uh, if you only customize one of the parameter files, say you only customize the um, forecast hour zero, um, you can put just that single file in the um, case root sort mods directory, and then Seam will use that just that file from uh, that directory. Um, so just use the forecast hour zero uh, text file from that directory. And then it would pull the other one from the pre-configured um, default directory. So you don't have to modify both of them if you don't wish to. Um, another thing to mention is that if you've already set up and built and run your case and post has already been run, that's fine. Um, you can still modify and create this text file stick it in this directory, and then you can rerun just the, the post um, job and get the new output. Another optional uh, topic is regridding using the WGRIB2. So the model uh, and UPP output. So one thing to mention is UPP does not regrid to any uh, type of grid. So it, it just directly uses it. It is output in the same um, grid as the, the model itself. And so at the UPP output, since MRW is on a Gaussian grid, is also on a Gaussian grid. And you can interpolate this to a new projection using the WGRIB2 utility. And so this is a generic usage command. So you would use WGRIB2, your input file, new grid wins, and W, this W here in bold would be uh, either earth or grid. Earth um, means that your U wind is eastward and your V wind is northward. And grid means that your U wind goes from uh, grid i comma j to i plus one comma j and I didn't put the v1 in here but it's also similar. And then new grid a b c are the grid specifications so a would be the grid type with um, possible extra parameters if that grid type has extra parameters. 
the B, which is your X or longitude grid specifications, C, which would be your Y or latitude uh, specifications, and then your output file. So that's the basic generic usage command. You can find more examples um, online here, but I do have a couple of the um, more common examples that you might want to know um, on this slide. So for lat long grid, if you wanted to regrid to that, and I didn't include the you know new grid wins here, so this is just um, new grid. Um, here is your your A, your B, and your C. So the grid type would be lat lawn, and then this would be your lawn specifications and your latitude specifications. So the first one for a lat long grid is lawn or lat zero. This is the longitude or latitude of your first grid point in degrees. The second one would be your n lawn or n lat, and that's the number of longitudes or latitudes. And then the third is the d lawn d lat, and that's the grid resolution in degrees of longitude or latitude. And then similarly for the Lambert, Lambert um, conformal grid, um, your grid type um, would be Lambert. And then there's some extra uh, parameters that it also requires. So your um, LOV and your lat in one and lat in two that you would include in that. And then similar to the latitude and longitude grid, you would have you, you know, your lawn zero, lat zero, um, your NX and Y for number of grid points along the XY, and then DX and DY, which is your grid cell size in meters in the X and Y direction. So that's a little bit different than the latitude longitude. Again, there's more examples on that uh, link that was provided in the previous slide for regridding. All right, so aside from uh, regridding other uh, you, uh, the UPP output can be used for a number of downstream applications, and these is this is just some examples um, for that. So the w, WMO group uh, standard group two output can be used in a number of downstream applications uh, quite easily. So for example, a visualization and plotting software, um, you can use NCL or your favorite plotting software, um, Python, whatever whatever you like to use um, and uh, to, to produce some of the output from the diagnostic fields that UPP um, does uh, create. Um, also verification software, it can easily be used and ingested in the model evaluation tools, um, the MET package, that is also um, developed and distributed by the DTC as well. And then finally, this is some ongoing activities. So right now we have an initiative to further unify the UPP by merging separate repositories and consolidating directory structures and uh, building methods between the different applications. And so that's coming along nicely. We've, um, we've been uh, working on that just to, to unify it, make it um, uh, just, just easier to use. All right, so, and then the second one is the refactor project um, that's ongoing at EMC. And this is uh, a large project um, that is uh, encompassing two years. So for year one, which is still ongoing, um, they are cleaning up and modernizing the code. Um, for example, um, they are removing all GRIB1 um, code as well as um, removing old legacy go-to statements, things like that. Um, they're developing reusable and interoperable modules and documenting variable dependencies. And I know this first one of cleaning up and modernizing um, just got pushed uh, yesterday. So that, that part is done and they're continuing with like documenting dependencies and um, these uh, modules as well. In year two, uh, the plan is to increase parallelism. Currently, it's only in the J direction, and uh, there's plans to add the decomposition for parallel, parallelism in the uh, uh, X direction as well. And then, obviously, validation and evaluation by the various code managers and developers of all the models that support, that are supported by the UPP. All right. 
And that is all I have. And at this time, I will take questions. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Sure. Appreciate that. Um, there are a couple questions in Slack. Um, there is one from Dave Ovens. If, if you'd like to, Dave, you can unmute and ask, or I can ask it for you. Dave's question is just curious if the exercises we've been doing in the practical session have left the GRIB2 output on the Gaussian grid or has Seam done a WGRIB2 conversion to a more standard grid? I believe that they are still on the Gaussian grid. Um, I ran through the practice myself and I remember seeing that the post output was on a Gaussian grid. All right. So I guess I guess I'd just say, you know, feel free to try out the WGRIB2 functionality. If you'd like to try um, post processing that to a different grid, definitely feel free to do that in this afternoon's practice, practice session. Yes, um, there is um, in the practice session, there is um, an example of doing that uh, using WGRIB2. So great. Okay, and then the second question was from Guanxing, and he asked, um, UPP is also used to post-process WARF files. So does the UPP actually read post-config nt.txt or post-config ntgfs.txt? This depends on your model. Yeah, I should have made that more clear. Um, so there is a number of, uh, of uh, uh, text, flat text files, and each one is for a different model. Um, and you'll see that in the PARM directory. So for the GFS, it will use the specific GFS ones. Um, and then there is a different postex config text file for uh, WARF, HER, RAP, and so on, as well as the um, uh, limited aerial model uh, for the SRW. All right, great. Thanks for that clarification. And Guangqing, if you need anything further, please let us know. Um, and then let's see, Ufuk just mentioned that Seam does not call WGRIB2 at this point. It only calls the post-processing tool. So it is on the Gaussian grid. And then there's a question, can you also control the time interval of output files? The time, uh, UPP does not control the time interval of output files. So I guess maybe some clarification on what you mean um, there with that question, it yeah. just processes whatever model output time interval right. there is. Right. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> um, any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Tracy. Appreciate sure. that. Okay, so uh, next on the schedule is at 1045, we're gonna have a practical session. And so we'll jump off of the Zoom meeting here and go into our Google Meet link um, for that. And then we'll come back after lunch into this same session for our last lecture of today. Um, and that'll be at one o'clock mountain time. So, so again, um, in about 20 minutes or so, We'll meet in the practical session, Google Meet link, and um, stay there until lunch break, and then we'll come back here in the afternoon. Any questions on any of those logistics? Or any other announcements from anybody else? Okay, great. Well, we will see you all in the practice session in about 20 minutes. Thank you.